Okay, so last time we went through <coughs> uh, some of the questions from the sample final, last year's sample final, and today we'll go through, uh, we'll go through the, the rest of the questions. So we'll start with uh, question three. So in fact now, I think I need the uh, Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, sorry, I should have uh, set up that earlier. I didn't realize that I would need this. Uh, so question three, you are given the code for the simple tree walk algorithm for code generation, which is this code that we covered in class. Uh, so this is for generating code to gener for generating code for expressions. Uh, so the the first question is draw next to the above code the abstract syntax tree for the following uh, expression. So this expression, yeah, so this is straightforward, x times uh, y. So that now this should be very easy for us at this point. Uh, so the multiplication of x and y. And this is the uh, division, uh, seven and z. division of 7 and z. So OK, so this should be easy, uh, but write the iloc code that the above code generator will generate if the input to the above algorithm is the abstract syntax tree uh, that you drew in, in part A. So, okay, so let me rewrite it here. Um, divide and x. Yeah, so we can see x and y and 7 and z, so that we can write the code here. OK, so what's the iloc code that will get generated? So in this case, uh, using this code, so this is the DFS algorithm that we described in class, and the registers for the uh, F the register for the result is computed after the expressions. So in this case, the registers are going to be, uh, you know, this is going to be in R1, and this is going to be in R2, and this is going to be in R3, and this is going to be in R4, R5, R6, and R7. So first, there will be a load. I'm not going to write the complete syntax, so it's load x into r1, load y into r2, and then multiply r1 and r2 and put the result in r3, then load immediate 7 into r4, and load z into r5, and then divide R4 and R5 and put the result in R6 and finally what's the last instruction add <coughs> add R1 R3 and R6. R6 and put the result in R7 okay so now the question so this so far this is very straightforward uh, the question that requires a little bit of thinking is if we reverse the order of lines 4 5 and 6 in the above code, uh, without changing the text of the statements, uh, will that affect the generated iloc? Uh, you know, if no, explain why. If yes, write the code after that uh, change. 
uh, okay so which one uh, I think these four the four five and six yeah, so, yeah. so if we if we do six then five then four what will happen well it, the, the order of the registers will be <coughs> reversed for one and two mm -hmm. it'll go down it'll go down the uh, right tree first yeah so exactly so two two things will change first it will go to the right before the left if we reverse these it will go to the right before the left then the other change is that it will number the result it will give you know this is finding a register for the result will, will happen before finding the register for the uh, the operands so it will do so let's erase these so in this case uh, this is going to be R1 then it will go right this is R2 then it will go right this is going to be R3 this is R4 then it will go to this branch it will do R5 then this is R6 this is R7 okay so what uh, what will happen in fact the code is going to be uh, no it will not be the same so it will generate uh, code for the right before generating code for the left so it will do uh, yeah so it uh, so it will do load the first thing that will happen is loading z or let's So uh, first thing is loading Z into R3, loading immediate 7 into R4, then dividing R, uh, R4 and R, dividing R4 and R3. Okay, because the emit will still, uh, it's, uh, the, the emit instruction will still take the um, the left hand side before the uh, the right hand side so it's uh, uh, oh in fact we are uh, switching them so it's uh, we are doing we are generating t2 first yeah but t2 will still be the second one so the the, the instruction will not uh, change so even though we are generating this operand we are loading this we are loading the right operand before loading the left operand, but the divide instruction will still have the, uh, you know, the first operand, so it will have the 7 uh, before the, the Z. So in this case, uh, you know, the 7 will be T1, and this is T2. Okay? So... Uh, and so this will divide R4 and R3 and it will put the result in R2 and for the other branch uh, same thing will happen so we will load Y into R6 and then we will load X into R7 and then we will multiply R7 by R6 and we will put the result in R5 and finally we will add R5 and R2 and we will put the result in R1 okay so this is a question you know that requires a little bit of thinking but it also requires that you fully understand how this works how this traversal works yes can you explain why when you're dividing or doing any arithmetic you're doing uh, left and right instead of right and left yeah because it's uh, first if you look at this so t1 is going to be the left so this emit is going to do left right Sorry about that. yeah so t1 is left and t2 is right even though we are loading right before left but we are still you know the emit we're emitting the this is the left hand operand and this is the right hand operand Okay, so this is one question. Any questions on this? We did do something like this in class. I specifically remember that. 
yeah uh, okay so now this question uh, on uh, code generation and this is uh, you know if you did the assignment if you did assignment 5 this should be a piece of cake for you uh, uh, okay so again you're practicing code generation for this so this is but assuming that uh, X and Y and Z and they all the variables are already in registers this uh, this assumption is to simplify things otherwise the solution will be very messy because you will have to load the variables into registers so basically to avoid uh, that code that loads variables into registers let's assume that every variable here is already loaded in a register that has its name to simplify things and to focus on uh, generating code for this uh, uh, you know for this construct that consists of a conditional and a loop inside so first of all you know we will uh, add uh, x and so it th there will be code for adding uh, Rx RY. and Ry and we put the result into Rz then we will have an if statement and an if statement is a compare right so we compare greater than, greater than. compare greater than of A and B so it, we are comparing Ra and Rb and we are putting the result now we'll have to put the result in some register let's call it uh, r1 and then we are branching so we are uh, conditional branching based on r1 to label let's call it l1 uh, l1 then or uh, l1 else so t for then and e for else and th just the same notation that you have used in assignment 5 so the then part is going to be L1 then. L1 then will have this, all of this code in it. And L1 else uh, is going to be this. So L1 else is going to be this code, Z equals Y plus A, which is uh, add r y and r z no r y and r a and put the result in r z and uh, okay and there will be the l1 merge l1 merge is what we merge after we are done with the f so this is going to be another add of our x and our b and put the result into our x <coughs> so we are done with the if now we have to put the the then part which will have a loop in it so the first instruction in the then part is going to be adding x and c so it's adding our x and our c and putting the result our x and our z then we will have the while loop. while loop inside. So the while loop will have a, a compare. Oh, so this is uh, compare, not. So this is conditional branch and this is compare. Nobody caught this. So this is a compare uh, less than or equal of R A and R C, and we put the result into R two. And we conditional branch based on R2 to uh, L2 body of the loop or L2 out of the loop. So this is the body of the loop or let's put a body of the loop or output of the loop. And the body of the loop is going to be L2 branch. L2 body uh, and L2 body the body of the loop has only this multiplying X and Y 
multi R X and R Y and put the result into R Z. So, so this is the body of the loop. Yeah. Now, in the body of the loop, we'll have to jump to uh, the condition, right? So we have to uh, jump to where we compute the condition, which is, uh, which is doing the compare. So we need a label, L2 condition, jump to L2 condition. <coughs> and this is the body of the loop. And after the body of the loop, we'll have the, uh, that's it, add, um, no, subtracting, uh, yeah, so, so the subtraction is going to be L2O. Out of the loop, we will be doing subtract of uh, RY and RZ, and, and we'll put the result into <coughs> RX. So this is outside the, the loop. So this basically we have the loop. So what is missing is the jump for the if. So uh, this is the loop. So this is all the code for the for the loop. Uh, then we have no. In fact, the out is outside the loop. And so we have this out. Now what is missing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we need to jump past the else. Past the else. So we jumped into L1 merge if we are doing the then part. L1 merge. Okay. So, you know, if you worked on assignment five, then, you know, this is basically the, uh, you know, the, the, the <laughs> all, what you were. Yeah. All, doing in during an assignment five so this is basically what you were doing and you should be familiar and you should have a yeah. well, what, what if we get some of the label types wrong like like we put l1 and say l1 and we put like l1x or something like that yeah well as long as they are correct so there is not wrong so there is we have to distinguish between wrong labels and labels that follow a different naming convention so you can, if you know, if you have uh, correct labels, you know, if they are logically correct, but they follow a different convention, like you just number them L1, L2, L3, L4, uh, how many of them? We have six of them, so you number them L1 through L6. A different numbering scheme is not a mistake. Okay. So it will just make my life harder when I grade it. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Yeah. But uh, it will be, as long as it's correct, you should get full credit for it. Okay. Uh, Unless the question specifically says that you, you should, uh, if the question says that you should use this oh, convention, oh, naming convention. Yeah, I should get my mouth shut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and even in the assignment, you know, in the assignment, if you did the labels right, yeah. but using a different convention, uh, you will only lose a few points. You will not, uh, you will not get a zero because you use a different naming convention for the labels, yeah. right? It's. Uh, the problem statement says yeah, that you have to use this naming convention. It's described in the problem statement. Mm -hmm. So you will not get full credit if you do a different convention. But this is a minor mistake. This is, not, this is a minor issue. You know, if your right. code is correct, logically correct, and your labels are correct, then uh, you'll only lose a few points. Yeah. But you will make our life harder in grading. Yeah, the, put, put the it will not match. So we'll have to, uh, you know, we'll have to check it manually. It will not match our, um, you know, our reference output, and then it will take more time to, to grade. So I hope that everyone uh, used the the same naming convention. The purpose of the naming convention is to standardize things and to get everyone to generate the the same output. Okay, questions. Yeah, so there will definitely be a question like this because this is, uh, you know, tests you on assignment, on the major assignment for, the, uh, for this course. The basic block. Oh, the next, yeah. So now we'll have to divide it into basic blocks and do the control flow graph. Yeah, so then I should have, uh, yeah, so these will get confusing get us confused okay so now dividing this into a basic basic blocks 
So now, whenever there is a branch that marks the end of a basic block, whenever there is a label that marks the beginning of a basic block. So here is a conditional branch, then this is the end of a basic block. This is a label, this is the beginning of a basic block. This is a label, the beginning of another basic block, and it ends at the conditional branch. Label, beginning of a new basic block, and it ends at the jump. So any jump or branch declares the end or marks the end of a basic block. A jump is the end of a basic block, and label is the beginning of a basic block, and label is, a, is the beginning of a basic block. Now. Let's give them names. Yeah, so logically, I, you know, we should name them uh, in order. I, let me erase this. It's getting in the way. Uh, so I'm going to call this BB1, 2, BB3, BB4, BB5. BB6 and BB7. Now the control flow graph. So here's BB1. Where does BB1 go? So it conditional branches to either uh, L1T, so it goes to BB2, or it goes to L1E, which is BB6. Okay, now BB2, where does BB2 go? BB2, uh, it doesn't have a branch, so it, uh, it always falls through uh, to BB3. So it's a fall through because there is no branching. Uh, okay, L so where does BB3 go? There is a conditional branch. So it goes either to L2B, which is BB4, so it either goes to BB4 uh, or it goes to L2O, and L2O is BB5. Now, where does BB4 go? It, uh, it always jumps to uh, L2C, and L2C is BB3. Okay, L2C is BB3, so BB5 jumps to uh, BB3. Uh, it's BB4. BB4. L, it jumps to L2C. Yeah, yeah, you put BB5, it's BB4 that jumps, um, yeah. jumps back. BB5 jumps to what? Uh, OK, BB4. yeah. So BB4 jumps to BB3, L2C, which is BB3. So this is the loop. We should have a loop. Now BB5, it jumps to L1M. And L1M is BB7, so we'll put BB7 here. And BB5 goes to BB7. Now BB6, uh, so BB5, it jumps. It only goes to BB7, and we did BB4. Now BB6, it, it falls through to BB7. And BB7 is the end basic block in this, uh, in this uh, code, in this piece of code, or in this control flow graph. So this is the control flow graph. Yeah, so this is, uh, uh, you know, th this is relatively easy, but it's very important, because this is important, uh, you know, these are important compiler concepts, you know, this code generation and this, uh, the control flow graph, so these are important compiler concepts. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm yeah, losing there. I didn't bring my charger. So let's do the the question. Yeah. So there is a question. Yeah, let's do yeah. So there is a question on local register allocation. Uh, this question on local register allocation is, uh, is on the local register allocation algorithm that we have studied. Uh, so, you know, usually, uh, you know, I never, you know, whether it's in the compiler class or in the algorithms class, 
You know, I never ask you to just you know, write the pseudocode for an algorithm. Usually I give you the code, but I ask you questions about it, and sometimes I ask you to modify it, to modify the given code, uh, to make certain changes. So here, let's do a, a question on tracing this. So this is the local register allocation algorithm. Oh, uh, yeah, I did not distribute this, so I will, I will post it. So this is the algorithm, and we would like to trace it on this code. So the code is this, so we have these loads. So now, in this algorithm, so let's apply the algorithm to this. What will be the, the first instruction? Load. Loading A into P1, right? So assuming, I think, two physical registers. Uh, is it two? Yeah. Two physical registers. Okay. So load. Oh, sorry. The, yeah, let's go through it one by one. So load A into P1, then load B into P2. Now, after that, we'll have to store one of them uh, to store because we will need to load for C. So we'll have to store the one that will get used uh, the farthest in the future. The one that will get used farthest in the future, is it R1 or R2? R2. Yeah, so this is R1 and this. So R2 will get used farther in the future. So we will spill R2 here. So we'll store P2 into uh, the location for B. Then we load C. But then, then we load C. But in order to find a... A register for D, again, we will have to spill again. So we will have to load either uh, R3 or R1. And again, R3 is used after R1. So R1 is used, uh, the, 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 it's the used closer in the future. So this is farther in the future. So again, we will spill uh, R3. So here we are storing uh, P2 into the, the location of, R, of C. Then we load D. Then we add P1 and P2. So this is the add. Adding P1 and P2. And we put the result in, in P1 now because after this, R1 and R4 will not be used. So this is the end of the live ranges for R1 and R4. They are not used below this point. So we, we assign P1 to R5. And then we will have to find a register for uh, the operands of R2 and R3. And the uh, operands for R2, so we'll, for R2 we will get, uh, we are using now P1 for the result. So for R2, we will get uh, P2. So B will get loaded into P2. Uh, so, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so this is my fault. Um, uh, yeah, so, okay. So it's, uh, yeah, so we lose the, uh, you know, unless someone has a, does anyone has a cable? Have a cable for this? Yeah, it's my fault. I don't know why it, uh, I did not charge it between the lectures. Uh, but uh, anyway, so we, we, this is the result P1, uh, for the add, the result of the add is get uh, uh, loaded into P1. Then we load P2 into uh, B into register P2. Uh, but then we will have to uh, we'll have to uh, spill one of them because we need the second operand for the multiply. Because we need the second operand for the multiply, so we'll have to spill the result of the add, which is R5, which is in P1. So we spill P1. Because so that we can load the other operand for the multiply, and then we will have the operands of the multiply in P1 and P2, uh, and then we will have to load. Uh, we'll have to find the register for the operand of the divide, uh, the other operand of the divide, because R6 is already in a register, and we do the divide. Then we s and we put the result in P1. So this is a tracing question on this uh, 
local register allocation algorithm. So this is, uh, uh, you know, make sure that you cover, uh, you cover this, uh, this algorithm and that you will be able to trace, to trace it and uh, possibly, uh, you know, I may ask you about the, the code itself. I may ask you to make uh, certain changes to the code or, um, you know, I may put print statements into this code and I ask you to, uh, to, to give the output of the program with these print statements. So we have studied basically three algorithms for uh, register allocation and instruction scheduling algorithms. We, we, are, we ran out of uh, power. So we studied two register allocation algorithms, the local and the global, and we studied one instruction scheduling algorithm. And these algorithms were studied in deta detail. So make sure that you, uh, you, know, you understand them thoroughly. You understand these three algorithms thoroughly. So there will be uh, questions in the final. At least there will be two questions. You know, there will be questions on two of them. I haven't decided yet because I haven't, uh, I haven't written the test yet. But there will be at least you know, questions on at least two of them. Uh, because this is the main material uh, that we did after the, the midterm and after doing the abstract syntax tree stuff. Uh, OK, so we did the uh, questions three and four. Uh, luckily, we did global register allocation last time. So I'm not going to do an LR1 parsing question because you will find four examples in the recorded lectures. So in the recorded lectures, there will be four examples on LR1. We did you know, two examples when we introduced the topic. Then we did an example from the homework, from homework three. Then we did the example in the, uh, from the, uh, the midterm. So there will be, you will find four examples on LR1 uh, parsing in the, uh, in the recorded lectures. So make sure that you, uh, you, know, you prepare well for LR1 parsing, LL1 parsing, and first and follow sets. You know, definitely I will ask you about first and follow sets uh, to make sure that now everyone understands them correctly. Uh, and there will be another parsing question, but I don't know yet if it's going to be LL1 or LR1. So study both. So be prepared for both LR1 and LL1. What about, yeah. left, what about left recursion elimination? Is that fair game on the exam too? Yeah, because it's part of LL1. So LL1 doesn't work without left recursion elimination. So this is an important part of LL1. Uh, I will be posting some of these sample questions. Uh, so I have here some uh, conceptual questions. <coughs> I will post these. So conceptual questions, uh, and I think th uh, you know, most likely I will have a conceptual, a short conceptual question. question. Uh, which could be multiple choice. So let's go through some samples of conceptual questions. Uh, briefly describe in, the m in at most two lines what each of the following compiler terms of or optimizations uh, means. Uh, LL1 parsing. So what does LL1 parsing mean? Right to left, top to bottom. Is well, the no. Descent. No, LL1 is not right to left. Otherwise, to right. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. yeah, it's leftmost recursive, right? Okay, but well, th th there is L and L and one, so you have to to specify what the first oh. L means and what the second L means and what the one means. Yeah. Okay, so it's it's left recursive. That's the first L. The second L is it's read left to right, and the one is that there is one look ahead. Okay, but I think the first L is the one that means scanning the input from left to right. Because in, in LR1 parsing, we also scan from left to right. So oh. they both start with L. So the first L is the, uh, yeah, the, the order for scanning the input. We scan the input from left to right. The second L is we do leftmost derivation. And the, the one means one symbol of look ahead. OK. Uh, the subset construction. What's the subset construction? <laughs> but it's th the name, you know, just think of the name. The name can be a very good mnemonic here. It generates the first and follow sets? Or? No way. 
No. I think, is it convert NFA to DFA? Yeah, exactly. Ah. The, you know, that's why the name is mnemonic and mnemonic. It, you know, if you understand how the conversion from NFA to DFA happens, it's, it's based on the subset construction because we're looking at the power set of the states of the NFA. So that's the subset construction. Uh, the symbol table. What's the symbol table? Oh. This is an easy question. Uh, yeah, OK, go ahead. It's the table that, that when you're parsing, it, ha it has all the identified symbols for the identifiers. It, it, it collects this, those symbols, and you can allocate memory <coughs> to them. And, and it's implemented usually as a hash table for speed. OK. So it has the names of the declared variables. So the symbols are the variables, the declared variables, and information about these variables, such as the address of each variable in memory. So this is one of the most important pieces of information about a variable, the address or the offset of that variable in memory. Uh, a local optimization. Local optimization. What does a local optimization mean? Yes? Optimization within basic blocks? Yeah, exactly. So that's what it means. An, a local optimization is an optimization within a basic block. <coughs> uh, loop invariant code motion. No, oh, someone else. I'm looking for someone else. <laughs> Yeah, you, you have already <laughs> answered many questions. OK. <coughs> but who knows the answer? I know the answer, but. OK. So what's loop invariant code motion? OK, Chris. So it's taking a code in a loop that doesn't depend on the, um, what, what's changing inside the loop. You're taking that code and moving it outside. Yeah, it doesn't depend on the loop variable, the, 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 the loop counter. It doesn't change within the loop. Yeah, code that doesn't change within the loop, you take it outside the loop. Uh, OK. Briefly explain the impact of pre-allocation or pre-pass instruction scheduling on, register, uh, on the register allocation pass and on the program's execution time. So what's the impact of pre-allocation instruction scheduling on register allocation? What's the relation between the two? What's the link? OK, I don't have very many options. OK, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the prefetch allows, if you're going to process data in a loop, it'll, it, it No, no, not prefetching. Oh. Pre-allocation pre instruction scheduling. So uh, instruction scheduling that happens before register allocation. Oh. The pre-pass instruction scheduling. How does it impact register allocation? So what's the link between the two? It's one term. Yeah, so it's register pressure. Because, yeah, because instruction scheduling before register allocation can affect the register pressure, the number of registers that we need. And that can have an impact on register allocation. Uh, OK, post pass, we didn't talk about post pass much. So I'm not going to ask you about post pass. Now, OK, here's an interesting question. Which part of the? which part or which pass in the compiler will you need to modify in order to do each of the following and be as specific as possible? Uh, OK. Uh, add support for an instruction set extension, an extension to the instruction set, like adding new instructions. You know, you are uh, uh, modifying the compiler so that it can take advantage of new instructions that got introduced to the architecture. Yes. You have to edit the, the grammar within the parser. The grammar? Uh, no, the grammar doesn't. It's, it's very high level. The grammar doesn't see instructions. Okay. It's, you know, we, we care about instructions in which, what's the, the, the most relevant pass here? The most relevant pass in the compiler that cares about instructions and which instructions the target machine has? The instruction selection? Exactly, yeah. It's the instruction selection. It's the instruction selection pass, which unfortunately did, we did not cover uh, an algorithm for, but we talked about it, that instruction selection is the pass in which you select the actual machine instructions. OK. Account, accounting for changes in instruction latencies. So this is obvious. 
So which pass do we modify to account for latencies and in instruction, to account for changes in instruction latencies? Which pass? Instruction scheduling. Instruction scheduling is the pass that in which we account for latencies. Setting a limit on the length of a variable name. OK, someone else? <laughs> <laughs> Setting a limit on the length of a variable name? That's easy. Scanner. Yeah, the scanner. So it's in the scanner where we define the rules for the variable names. So that's in the scanner. Uh, changing the precedence rules of arithmetic and logic operations. <coughs> so where do we change the precedence rules? <laughs> yes? Within the parser? Yeah, within the parser, we modify the grammar. So we have to modify the grammar in order to change the precedence rules. So if we, for some reason, we decide to make the add, to give the add higher precedence than the multiply, I don't know why, would, why, we would, why we would do that, but we do it in the, by changing the grammar. Okay. Uh, why doesn't left recursion work, or why doesn't left recursion work with LL1 parsing, or why doesn't LL1 parsing work when you have left recursion? That, that, that would be a better way of phrasing the question. Why doesn't LL1 parsing work when you have left recursion? Uh, okay. I'll go out on a limb here. <coughs> uh, it has to do with the number of nodes created because it'll keep going. It'll just create the thing down on one tree all the way going down the left side. Of the tree. Okay. Uh, not clear. Can anyone clarify it better? Yes. Doesn't it get stuck in a, a eternal recursion of just continually going left? Uh, yes, in an infinite loop. Yeah, because if it if the parser does substitution systematically, if it systematically makes the same substitution at each level, it will get stuck in an infinite loop if there is left recursion in the grammar. OK. Give an example of an LR1 parsing state with a shift-reduce conflict. And briefly co explain the conflict that you have. So can anyone give an example of a state with a shift-reduce conflict in it? Of course, you know, whenever you are asked for a, an example, think of a simple example. So all what we need is two productions. So I will help you. So one production, and these two productions should be for the same, uh, yeah, two different productions for the same variable. How can we have a shift-reduce error? So, or a shift-reduce conflict. If we have, for example, A, B, and then, or we could have A, B, uh, C, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, but what does this the look ahead here have to be? Uh, C. C. The end of file. No, C, not end of file. Okay. If the look ahead is C, because now, if I am in this state, and I am seeing C as my look ahead, C is the next symbol in the input. I have two options, either to reduce by this or to shift by this. So here the look ahead does not matter. Does not matter what the look ahead for this is. Uh, so if you get something like this, here you have two options. I can reduce if the look ahead is C. And if the look ahead is C, I can shift. So this is the shift reduce error. OK. All right, so these are some you know, conceptual questions. I will, uh, you know, there will be questions like this, because I would like to cover 
you know, all the concepts to make sure that you understand all the compiler concepts and you can, uh, you know, link them together in your head. You, 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 uh, you know, you know which part does what.